Welcome to the Retrospection section, where we review writing we were once proud of. I'm Max. I'm Rava. And we love to make fun of ourselves. Today, we will be shitting on my book, The Environs, written in about 2008 when I was 12. It's book three in the same series as The Riders and The Rangers, but surpasses both in abhorrence, nonsensical plotlines, and gratuitous dialogue. This novel follows the continued adventures of Corinne and Evan, now age 19, as they literally race against time to bring down an extreme group of environmentalists intent on destroying the world. In this monstrosity of a story, Corinne time travels back 40 years to meet her younger self and stop the environs before it's too late. Jeffy the Dark Lord returns yet again, and Corinne time travels to 2007 simply because I wanted her to meet me in 7th grade. We know you won't be able to relax, so just sit back and cringe with us. The writers and the rangers are funny, okay? This one is just, like, I'm genuinely embarrassed about this shit. Okay. Children, sit down and be calm, cries the school teacher as she looks in desperation in the direction of her older assistant. But the crying children won't stop. I want my mommy, cries one. I want Dolly, shouts another, referring to a tattered little doll she'd forgotten to take in her backpack that morning before anyone knew there would be an attack. Sit down, please, the school teacher shouts again. This time the children obey, having nothing else to do. The old lady assistant with gray hair sits almost motionless in the corner of the room, waiting for something to happen. <laughs> Mrs. Walker, cries a little boy named Jack. Yes, Jack, the old lady says. They are getting closer, Jack complains. Do not worry, Mrs. Walker says. They will not find us. How do you know us, a little girl named Abigail? I just do, Mrs. Walker says determinedly. Mrs. Walker is right. The attack will be over soon, the school teacher says. But Mrs. A, Abigail cries, they're getting closer still. And they are. Please stay calm, my little ones, Mrs. A pleads. And then all at once, the attackers burst in, wearing their usual attire. Dark green long coats, dark sunglasses, gas masks, and black shiny boots. They point at the teacher's assistant. That's the one, they say into their walkie-talkies over the crying children. Take her, says one. Oh, wait, no, they have gas masks on. Take her, says one, apparently the leader. What do you want from me? Mrs. Walker cries. Your name is May Walker, is it not? The leader asks her. Yes, May confesses. We've been searching f 48 years for you, and now... The leader laughs bitterly. <laughs> we finally found you. Come with us. He motioned to the others. Oh, I love that tense change right there. Who marched forward and grabbed May Walker by the arms and dragged her out the door out into the ruined world. Wow, May says, <laughs> for being people who want to protect the environment so badly. You've sure done a great job at screwing it up. <laughs> a slight calamity, replies the leader, unshaken. When we blew up the cities to save that tree, we never actually thought it would destroy the tree as well. <laughs> that old, old pine tree was the oldest and last tree in the world, and you were the one who named it, were you not? Okay, pause for a second, because... There's at least three other trees mentioned in this story. Yes, A. Walker admits. The Aubrey tree, was it? And why was it called that? The leader asks. I refuse to tell you, May Walker says defiantly. Oh, I think you will tell us or we will send you back in time so you were never born, exclaims the leader fiendishly. You can do that, May Walker says. Yes, the leader says, holding up a vial. But if you cooperate and tell us why you named the tree, we will give you this. What is that? May Walker asks, looking in awe at the glowing pink liquid in the vial. It is the answer to all your problems, the leader explains. So you're telling me that stuff in the vial will bring my husband and my son back to life? May Walker asks, incredulous. Your husband never died, Miss Walker, the leader says, shedding his sunglasses and gas mask. No, May Walker screams. It can't be. Oh, the leader says, smiling a terrible smile. The irony. <laughs> I won't believe it, May Walker cries. The leader motions to the others. Give her the vial that will send her back so she was never born and we can take over the world as we originally planned. If you, How would sending a person back in time prevent them from being born? I think it's gonna send her back and, like, rewind her life so she was never conceived. But honestly, like every other, th like, instance in these plots, I didn't think it through. So I was like, that sounds cool. Let's do it. And then, so the old lady is, is Corinne. Oh and my the God, leader is Evan. Why is Corinne's name May Walker? She changed it so that the environs can't find her. And Walker is Evan's last name. So they were married. I wish I had answers for you. <laughs> I told you, I don't think they get answered. As far as I've read, they don't. I, I think I'm just going to make this more confusing. No, the tree is mentioned one time in like one line later. This next one, she's going back in time, but she something goes wrong because it's Corinne and she's special and et cetera, et cetera. So she's, they send her back in time and she um, 
ends up in this like white purgatory. Fine then, go ahead, echoed a voice from somewhere in the vast expanse of white. It sounded like my own. The white drew back and I was in a field. I have to say, I felt like a 20th again. For goodness sakes, maybe I was. Oh, I guess they're 20, not 19. Suddenly a person flew over me on some kind of a board, and I recognized those glowing amber eyes, the shiny brown hair, the distinctive superior determination about the girl standing before me. Hello, me, I said. Oh, so man. She, she just, like, ends up meeting herself. She's like, my name is Mae Walker, and I come from the future. And then I just marked it with future! So already we've got two Spongebob references. Future! Future! Well, they gave me a vial of stuff that was supposed to send me back in time so I was never born. But I guess I just wouldn't have it, so I stopped the process and ended up out here. I've been hunting the environs for 20 years and I never found them. I thought that they killed my husband after they blew up all the cities, but apparently dot dot dot, he joined them. Who? Evan? Nah, he'd never, said the other me, but I cut her off. He did, and believe me, if I hadn't met that girl in the first place, I might never have lost Evan. And what girl be that, said another voice I also recognized. Oh my god. I glanced at Corinne. She whispered, Amber likes to make a big entrance. Her name was Aubrey, I said. Amber and Corinne looked at each other. Yep, said Corinne. I knew there was something strange about that girl. Strange like supernatural, Amber said. Yeah, she was like a writer mistake, only creepy, Corinne said. Well, this in a more cheerful manner, I think it's time to call together the whole league. What do you say, Amber? I, Amber said, whistled a whistle so loud I couldn't even hear it. Wait a second. <laughs> Did the spelling of Corinne change between yes. books? Why? I think the writers might have been a later version where I like control F'd it and changed it to C-O-R-Y-N. Oh. And this one, it's C-A-R-Y-N because... But I changed it because people kept pronouncing it Karen. And I was and like, gotta that's, be not, special. That's, a, that's not a badass name. Her name is not Karen. Oh, look! Seconds later, about eight more people burst out of the trees on more of the flying boards. Oh my gosh. I recognized many of the faces. Adriana, Evan, Juniper, Wenda, and the dreaded Aubrey. And horribly, surprisingly, Jeffy. I'd never seen the other two who looked about two years younger than me. I forgot about Jeffy again. <laughs> I mean, I didn't forget about him, but like, it took me a minute. Why is that horribly? And I was like, oh yeah, he was a villain. Why is he here? Yeah, he's a, he was a villain twice. They killed him and then they killed him again. Anyway, so there's another person named Olive. <laughs> I die. I live. I die again. I live. I die. I live again. So this is, well, we don't know his name because he can't talk, but we call him Eyeball, courtesy of the fact that he can see 10 miles away without binoculars. Um, and this here is Jeffy, which, I, okay, so remember Eyeball, it comes in, he's important later. Guess what? He's a character back from the dead. Oh and my this god. here is Jeffy, which I assume you already knew. He's here because he apparently knew some vital information about the environment, so we had to bring him back to life. So the next one is a girl randomly pops out of a bush. So we automatically <gasps> know she is a new character. Of course. Yes, trees, because, Harper. yeah returning trees are for returning characters so a rustle came from a, near, a nearby forest and a badly wounded girl appeared help she cried and i rushed to her calm down i said what is it there's a beast rampaging through the forest i tried to run from it but it was too fast the girl said gasping for breath corinne looked at me in a queer sort of way same and i nodded <laughs> just like old times i said so the girl isn't dying i don't know why uh i don't know why that's happening but yeah what do you mean it seems like the girl is like dying and bleeding and stuff like oh it caught me but oh yeah but like badly fine. wounded yeah she joins them i don't i don't know i don't know what's going on so they're fighting another monster yet again we got in a couple of good hits until the beast turned on us and the whole scene kind of crumbled the beast stopped terrorizing a group of people standing on a roof and noticed we were shooting at him he started running towards us at a breakneck speed and we all scattered everyone except corinne Corinne, come on, I yelled after her. I can get him, she shouted back. No, you can't. He's two times bigger than you, I pleaded. I can get him in one shot, Corinne yelled. Don't get overconfident, Corinne, I shouted. You think I'm overconfident? Well, I... Her sentence was cut short by the beast who had picked her up in its massive claws and threw her against a tree. The group and I watched in horror as she struggled to get up and fight, but the monster continued its onslaught and knocked her back off her feet. Nobody from the group dared join in the fight, for they knew they would also be mauled. But it was agonizing watching the distressing scene, and I had had enough. All right, I yelled, monster thing, prepare to meet your match. Meanwhile, while the group was biting their nails and Corinne was trying not to pass out, I was carefully trying to avoid the monster's horrible blows. I finally made it over to Corinne and grabbed her gun. I hadn't shot one of these things in a while, so it took me about three or four times to get a direct hit. But finally, I hit the monster right in the heart and it went down like the two tons of blubber it was. God dang. This is so embarrassing. <laughs> so Corinne dies. The dialogue is so bad, I can't even read it. So she's dying. Deus Ex Jeffy. Oh boy. They're like... They're like, you're the only writer left. He's like, no, I can't do it. What do you mean you can't? I said, I just can't. I mean, once they brought me back to life, I forgot how to change people. I'm sorry, he said. I looked gravely at Adriana. 
He's telling the truth, she said. Oh, yeah, because she can read minds. Once they brought me back to life, I forgot how to change people. Well, have you ever been brought to back to life? I bet it would make you forget some stuff. I, I don't to know. I mean, <laughs> Jesus didn't seem to forget a lot. <laughs> Crap, I said. Rangers can't change other rangers, right? Worse, Evan confessed. We aren't even rangers anymore. We were forced to what? give that up. A leftover escaper said if we didn't cooperate with his orders, he'd make us human again. We tried to fight him, but he won. So we're human now. So Corinne dies. Or they like, they literally, she doesn't die. They just leave her. But it's, it's assumed that she dies. And then May, the other Corinne is like, I decided I wanted to be Corinne. Now that you're dying and everything. <laughs> and so they leave, they leave her dying. We had no idea where we were going. Finally, I made a decision. I'd heard of something called a motorcycle from over 300 years ago, and I knew a person could get one from the now-abandoned ranger headquarters, the same as a flying board. I snapped my fingers, and two seconds later, a motorcycle came out of nowhere. <sighs> Deus Ex Motorcycle. So the, the girl that they save, they find out her name is Carissa. Edgy Evan Edgelord is like, what's your name? And the girl's like, um... Oh. Carissa. Evan laughed. You can't be shy if you're gonna hang with us. Yeah, the, I feel like I skipped a little bit between these next comments, but the new Corinne from the future so is old like Corinne. Old new Corinne punches a tree. You're making me beat up grass. She realizes she doesn't know where she's going. She finally is like, oh, my dad has a compass. I can ask him for his compass because apparently they're 500 years in the future and they don't have compasses on their person or GPS. Now all I had to do was find my dad. I remembered I still had my ranger handheld computer. I pulled it out of my pocket and found my dad on speed dial. I pressed call. Hello, said a voice. Dad, I said. Corinne. No, Corinne's dead. This is the other Corinne, I said, unable to properly explain the situation I was in. <laughs> Oh no, cried dad. Wait, what? And then he's just fine with it. He's like, okay. There's two of us. I traveled here from the future, but that's not important. What's important is I need your compass. Where are you? Nevada. I found the environs in Nevada. Where are you? Dad asked. He's so chill with like, no, your daughter's dead. This is your other daughter. <laughs> like, he's like, whatever. <laughs> okay, so, okay. Oh yeah, that is actually kind of important because he's like, I found the environs in Nevada, right? Well, later she gets on the phone with him again and he's like, oh shit. No, I meant Nevada City, California. <laughs> oh she's my like gosh. already in Nevada. <laughs> this is the beginning of Corinne's power set that she somehow gets. Well, okay, I'll be in Nevada City in four hours, but I gotta hang up. You know, I have to pay for minutes and everything. The year is 2347. Why are you paying for minutes? Because it's being written in 2007. <laughs> 2007. 2007. <laughs> And you're still paying for minutes. The environs hack her little cell phone or whatever. They're like, where are you going? And she starts to text them back. I'm going to see my dad. Where's your daddy? The text said. He's in Guam. I texted sarcastically. That's right. The environ text came back. Is it? I text in. Nothing. Are you even there? So um, mm. it's not very clear. She uh, has the power of persuasion where anything she says will come true oh okay so remember the person in book one who said evan looked like a monkey vaguely there's a girl in book one who they're fighting a monster they find her she's dead she created supreme riders then they bring her back to life and she fights with corinne and is like your boyfriend looks like a monkey anyway um, oh yeah i do remember that yeah because i was yeah. like wow that's almost really racist except evan is white I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Anyway, I, I mm. come on, Casey. No need to make such a dramatic entrance. Just step out from behind that tree over there. Returning character. 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 This one I tagged with what the fuck it what? Something was different. I can feel them, I said. What? Casey asked. There's nobody here. Oh my gosh, I can actually feel the environs coming. There is something weird about me. Back there when I told the environs my dad was in Guam, I wanted them to believe it. And they did, I blurted out. Could it have been something I ate? Casey just looked at me. Uh, a rabid squirrel, she suggested. What? No, I haven't been eating any squirrels lately. Maybe it was the potion or whatever the environs gave me to send me back oh. in time. Maybe because I stopped it, something went haywire, and now I'm stuck with insane powers. Stuck I with? <laughs> I wonder if- Get down, I yelled, knocking Casey to the ground before a bullet that I could actually sense coming hit her in the head. Oh man, I don't have a weapon, Casey answered. I threw her a couple of grenades I'd found in my motorcycle safety kit. <laughs> That's the opposite of what should be a safety kit. Angel! Angel! <laughs> and your motorcycle seat opens up and just poops out grenades down the road behind you. Angel! 
I mean, it's not pretty much loves... canon in that movie. Yeah, no, it, not it's not grenades, a, but like it's a machine gun. Didn't that he... movie's so iconic, though. I love that movie. Yo, for all for anyone listeners, listening, we're talking about Steel Frontier. It's it all on like... YouTube. Do yourself a favor and watch it. Is it, it. all on YouTube? It's the whole thing is on YouTube. Oh. This movie comes with an A plus retrospection section recommendation. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> back, back <laughs> now to that we're shit. yeah, now that we're off the the ad break, do we get paid for ad breaks? <laughs> it's like twenty five years too late to get paid to advertise that movie. Everyone in the group shouted at the same time. Eyeball can talk. It's not eyeball, said Eyeball. Well, who is it then? Jeffy asked. It's Otto. Otto Brophy. So then she meets Liz. She's a criminal, but I don't think it ever mentions what she did. They're in a dungeon now, too. Oh, yeah. Okay, so they get kidnapped by the... Uh, Corinne gets kidnapped by the environs um, and gets thrown into a dungeon with this girl named Liz. And that's pretty much all you need to know because... No, next day... there's more you need to know. Really? She had long brown hair with blonde highlights. She was wearing a long black trench coat, just like I used to wear when I was a writer. Okay, so she actually gets described unlike 90% of the people in this book. Exactly. Ugh. She's important enough to warrant description. Yeah, but she fucking dies like five pages later, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Okay, she's not important enough to warrant description. <laughs> So they turns out she used to be a writer. That's pretty much all I know about it. And even like when she explains that, like how they might know each other, it's it's like not even relevant. So whatever. How did you get out of the writer headquarters? I asked. I was hardly ever in it. I ran away when I was four, Liz said, thankfully. Yeah, stupid me. I had to spend 13 years in that place, I said. Hmm. Liz said, I know where they took your friend. Casey? Where? I said, finally realizing she wasn't here. <laughs> what a great friend. You see, the yeah. environs have some sort of- It is of Corinne. True. She's horrible. You see, the environs have some sort of torture chamber, Liz said simply. Oh no, I said. Oh yes, Liz said. I've already been in there twice. They don't know what it takes to kill a writer, but they just think you'll snap at one point or another. But since I'm a writer, they just couldn't figure out why I wasn't dying. And you never told them, I asked, suppressing giggles. Well, That's not Liz... a good time to giggle! I don't fucking know! <laughs> they torture me so much. They think you'll snap at one point or another, but they just couldn't figure out why I wasn't dying. <laughs> and you never told them? <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh my god, that's not an appropriate response. <laughs> it's Corinne. After she, like, laughs at Liz getting tortured, she's like, you never told them? Well, Liz trailed off. You did not, I said. I did, Liz said sadly. I'm so sorry. They couldn't kill writers with their contraptions, but they can still hurt us with it. So then now they know how to kill writers. Oh, so Corinne still has these weird powers that she's finding out about. The fate oh. of the entire world could depend on me right now, and I'm stuck in his cell while my friend could be enduring that new contraption right now. I gotta get out of here, I yelled, and punched the bars that kept us locked inside this putrid cave. The bars contorted into a ball. Holy oh crap, my Liz said wide eye. How in the heck did you do that? There's this potion that I drank, and Liz cut me off. I don't want to hear it, Liz said. Let's get out. Yeah, big, I don't want to hear it either. A big, mean-looking environment stepped out in front of us. Going somewhere, he asked meanly. Is he mean? I can't tell. I guess it's time for you to try out the new machine then, said the man. Oh, how I wanted to punch him in the face. But I knew even I didn't have the strength to bring this big brute to the ground. Even though you, like, magically contorted steel bars, you can't punch <laughs> this guy. Corinne fuel can't melt steel beams. <laughs> this is the first torture scene I ever wrote. Do you, oh, this is gonna be good. Do you want to read this or do you want me to read it? I can read it if you want. <laughs> Please! No, you're gonna read it like so much more seriously than I. Okay, but looking at now, I already have a question. What does kill a writer? You can only kill a writer by puncturing or slicing. They have a special organ inside of them that like controls the rest of their organs. So if you get oh. rid of that organ, it like stops releasing their like healing factor stuff and then they die. I ask because in the middle of the room were two flat tables with deadly looking devices hanging from the ceiling above them. Yeah, they looked sharp enough to kill a writer. That's why, okay, so that's why when they find Corinne dying in the forest in book one, that's why her intestines are coming out is because you, you have to draw like, it's like a, cere it's super weird. It's like a ceremonial killing. You have to draw like an, you have to like take two swords and like slice it in an X. Is this Attack on Titan? Yes. <laughs> For being, like, as young and pure as most of this book is, that's surprisingly, like, dark. The man motioned to the flat table-like things. <laughs> <laughs> They're tables! They're just tables! <laughs> he wanted us to just lie down and let him kill us. I remember thinking, this is the end. Liz and I got on the tables and looked at each other. I could see defeat in Liz's eyes, and I wanted to do something, but I knew I couldn't. The man tied us down. Now, little girlies, said the oh man. My God. I'm not going to kill you immediately. I'm going to first give you some special treatment. Oh my god. 
I looked in Liz's direction, and she smiled. The man pressed a button. Some kind of strange gun things came up from the sides of the tables. He pressed another button. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, my eyes just went down the page. I <laughs> Blue lightning started emanating from the things. One of the arms of the lightning reached out and licked my arm. <laughs> out of my chair <laughs> my eyes just went to the word licked my arm i screamed <laughs> through clenched teeth i asked the man what have you done with casey i gave her the same treatment the man answered and pressed the button again this time a thicker arm came out from the guns and gingerly touched my hand like it was trying to be careful a jolt went through me and white dots crowded in the corners of my vision I painfully turned my head to look at Liz through the growing wall of blue lightning. She was doing about the same as me and looked my way. I tried to give her a smile, but I knew it wouldn't matter once all this was done. The man pressed a different button this time, and the lightning became more intense and thickened to create a writhing lightning bubble around me. It's actually kind of a cool image, but I have no idea what's going on. Now I couldn't even tell when the man was going to push the button. Apparently he pressed it again because the lightning began to writhe and twist and crackle with heat, and an arm of it reached out for my face and caressed it. <laughs> for a oh. moment I sank into blackness and was peacefully oblivious to the writhing lightning above me. Then I came back awake, but my eyesight did not. I couldn't see anymore. In my mind, I pleaded for the lightning to stop, and after licking me once more, it <laughs> did. <laughs> I could hear the guns retreating back into the tables, and another machine coming out. It was the writer killing machine. I don't know how she knows that, if she suddenly can't this? see, and she's getting <laughs> licked by lightning arms. I can't, I can't, I can't. It's like, it's... It's maliciously bad. <laughs> like, there's no other word for that. Like, there's no excuse. And then we skip to Evan. Yeah, so Evan and his little group are arguing about whether Otto's still evil or not. Then they get a call saying, like, come to Nevada City. You need to come now. Don't worry about who this is. Just come. And Evan's like, okay. Um, and then it, that's like four lines. And then, then it skips back to Corinne. The massive saw type thing started whirring and I could hear Liz whimpering on the table next to me. We were going to die and we both knew it. I could hear the machine getting closer to me. It's horrible whirring noise clogging up my ears with its loudness. When I could hear it about an inch away from me, I blanked out. My mind was a blank. I couldn't think, couldn't cry out, nothing. And the machine came closer and closer and then complete and total darkness, even with my ruined eyes. For a second, I tried to hold on, but it was too much, and I slipped into quiet blackness. Okay, so it's a writer killing machine, but guess what? She doesn't die. Ironically. I know, it's like the one time she's not dying. <laughs> the one thing that can't <laughs> kill her is the writer killing machine. All right, I think it's over. Yes. Topical is what this one is tagged with. Okay, so she wakes up in the hospital. Those environs are worse than I thought. I thought they just wanted to help the Earth at first, but now they're killing anyone who gets in their way, Evan said. That's not the half of it, I told him. In 40 years, if nobody does anything about them, the environs will take over the world. Honestly, at this point in my life, I was like a hardcore environmentalist. Like, I was giving speeches... No, okay, like, I spoke at, like, a freaking Ignite conference about climate change, all right? I, but, like, this whole book is about environmentalists that, like, are shitty. So, Otto, uh, so you made contact with Liz, was she in the area when I allegedly shot you, so you just found her and had her change you from evil to good again, I asked him. So, like, I s apparently saw good and evil as, like, these inherent traits oh, that, boy. like, you are one or the other. Okay, okay, so they're, they're in the hospital. Um, Liz, what happened to Liz? She's lying there. Um, how are you doing? I asked. Well, Liz answered, I lost half the blood in my body. How about you? Oh, okay. And then Corinne also finds out. So she's blind, but she can also see heat vision. They call the environs. She's like, listen, you immoral environs. I threatened. This is that girl you killed. Remember me? We're coming for you. If you're stupid enough to fight us, we'll be in the old car factory. But be warned. We're going to fight like heck, and we won't stop until every last one of you is dead. I hung up. The environments burst in. There's a hundred of them against, like, ten riders or whatever, or rangers or whatever the fuck they are now. Wait, no, 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 no. You skipped okay. something right again. The next day, we left the hospital and head for the environs' evil lair or whatever the heck it was. I'd taken off my head bandages because the doctor said it was okay. The good news was I got to wear cool sunglasses all the time. The bad news was it was raining like heck. <laughs> she has her priorities in order. She's like, go fire up the furnaces. And so Amber runs off to fire up the car furnaces. Or I don't freaking... Why are we firing up the furnaces? Are they going to pull some like molten lead off the battlements? Yes. Really? Yeah. What battle? 
ailments do they have? I tried to grab an environ by the wrist to flip him over, but he grabbed my wrist and flipped me over instead. Oh crap, I said. Upgrades. Jove, Jove, it's bubbling, Amber shouted and poured liquid metal from the furnaces over part of the environ robots. Some of them were robots and some were not, is in parentheses. What is Jove, Jove, it's bubbling? What is that? I'm not even going to question this shit anymore. They finally meet the leader of the environs. Take that, I screamed as an environ that was coming at me with a... I... What the... I screamed at an environ that was coming at me with a gun as I took out a sword I'd taken from an environ I'd, that I'd vanquished and ran him through. Oh my god. That is a sentence and Whoa. like three halves. I need to look at the nesting of this. Take that, I screamed at an environ and ran him through. Take that, I screamed at an environ as I took out a sword and ran him through. Like, that's just what we're starting yes. with. And then we get, I screamed at an environ that was coming at me with a gun. As I took out a sword, I'd taken from an environ that I'd vanquish. <laughs> I'm oh so my glad God. you're a linguist. So there's that horrible sentence. Take that, I screamed at an environ that was coming at me with a gun. As I took out a sword, I'd taken from an environ that I'd vanquished and ran it through. I noticed a pack of environs coming at me, and I got ready to teach them a lesson. They rammed into me, and I flew back against the wall but got back up. Is that the best you can do? Said a voice, presumably the leader of the environs, coming up behind me. I laughed. You ain't seen nothing yet. I admire your audacity, said the leader. I'm flattered, I said, and stuck my arm out to slash at a non-coming environ. You've got some nerve, said the leader, and just stared at me. I wish I could have stared back, but I got the whole heat vision thing going on, so I couldn't really stare back at him. You're blind. Literally or figuratively, I asked him sarcastically and ran an environ through. Both, said the leader, and drew his sword. Oh, great, I said, and people think I'm hot-headed. The leader laughed a terrible laugh. He bowed. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, whatever. Let's get this over with so I can get back to wiping the environs off the face of the earth. I yelled at him. Let's do this, the leader said. To the death, I said, doing my best to look him squarely in the eyes. To the death. No. To the pain. Uh, chapter 27. The leader, who was thankfully not Evan, fought well, but I knew I was too good. Face it, I said. You're doomed. I wouldn't be so sure, the leader said. At that exact moment, the leader and I both ran each other through. And then I realized something. Neither of us was dying. I laughed. Ha. It takes... Is this Pirates of the Caribbean? Yes. We to be two immortals locked in an epic battle until Judgment Day and the trumpet sounds. <laughs> or you could surrender. <laughs> ha! It takes more than that to kill a writer. And what does it take to kill you, an atomic bomb? No. The only way to kill me is to somehow get me to drink an antidote for a potion I invented to make a person immortal. TSX potion! Why would you tell someone that? But since that is quite unlikely to happen, I suppose we should just keep fighting until one of us gives up, said the leader. We'll be at this all day, I told him. That's a line from fucking League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. We'll be at this all day. <laughs> Indeed, the leader oh. agreed. I smiled my most chilling smile I could and slashed at him. You ingrate, he screamed. You cut my right arm off. <laughs> I noticed, I said. Just a flesh wound. But you're blind. How could you possibly- I cut him off. <laughs> Just like I cut off his arm. Just like his arm! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Care to give up, I said. The leader shook his head and picked up his sword in his left hand. <laughs> the hand he didn't use to fight. I am not left handed. <laughs> Why is this whole scene? This is like one big fucking pop reference. I don't know, but it's hilarious. What's your name? I asked him while I effortlessly blocked his pitiful attempts to stop me from defeating him. Dirk Mortimer, said the leader. Well then, I said. By your leave, Mr. Mortimer. By your leave, Mr. Norrington. <laughs> What are you? He asked with hatred. What am I? I said. I am me. What kind of name is Dirk Mortimer? Uh, it sounded evil, so I... If my parents named me that, I'd definitely be a villain. <laughs> the villains in these books, specifically, have super evil sounding names. In the next three... In the next trilogy, it's separated by trilogy. So there's a first generation, second generation, third generation. Second generation, there is a villain who's the president of the United States named Christoph Merck. Uh, in the next one, there is an evil robot named Demetrius Snow. And then finally, there's a villain named Elam Zared and his henchman Stryker Evel. Evel. <laughs> okay. Back to the environs. The lights go off because they Liz or some or Casey's there. Casey's there again. Uh, she turns all the lights off and confuses everybody. In the darkness, I heard a person scream. It wasn't a girly scream, so I knew it was a guy. It's Evan that's screaming. He gets pulled. Dirk Mortimer takes him and goes to put him on the torture machine. Casey, now, I yelled in the direction of the tunnel. Casey burst in and the environs all piled on top of her. Help, she cried. Oh, no, you don't, I yelled and pounced on the pile while the lightning around Evan was growing stronger by the second. Oh, it's gonna lick him. This whole scene is so comical. When I'd gotten all the environs off of Casey and on the ground, I went over to the control panel. Okay, I said, confused. I tried pressing one. Some deadly looking weapons came out of the table. Oops, I said. I pressed another. The machines retreated back into the table and another thing that looked like a giant chainsaw came out. Man, I exclaimed, these environs are really deranged. Then I spotted a big red button. I'd always heard never to press the big red button under any circumstances, but this was an emergency, so I went ahead and pressed it. 
All the weapons went back in the table and I ran over and untied Evan. So remember the tree thing? Yeah. It just happens. Like, there's the tree. Aubrey's dying underneath it. Oh no, okay, so Navirin is like about to kill Aubrey, the character we've really never met before right um i think the significance of the tree was less that it was like aubrey was a significant character i think it was just like that's the thing that sets the other things in motion and it's like the butterfly effect and it all started there like that's the like epicenter you have become the laura i know i speak for the trees anyway wenda dies remember in book one how jeffy's like in love with wenda yeah when they're escaping yeah and it's his like whisper of love or whatever so uh yeah. wenda dies Corinne tells Jeffy and she he's like, it's okay. It wasn't meant to be. He's <laughs> <laughs> fine. <laughs> oh, and then remember last episode when they're fighting and they're like, blast these escapers. They're seducedly erratic. Yeah. This one, they're fighting environs and she's like, blast these debauched environs. They're absurdly inconsistent. Oh my gosh. Deus ex Corinne. Again. Yes. I looked out over the sea of environs. Half of them were on the ground, but there was still more than 50 left and our group was still losing. Things were looking bad for us, but then I had an idea. I'd controlled their minds before. I could do it again. Oh my gosh. I took a deep breath and closed my eyes, just like the time I'd changed Evan into a writer so long ago. I thought to the environs, give up. And they did. They dropped their weapons and looked confused. I laughed. Oh yeah, nobody messes with me. Uh, said a voice. I do. I whirled around. Impressive, said Dirk Mortimer, whose arm I'd cut off earlier. <laughs> Yeah, well, oh boy. when you've got impressive powers, you can do impressive stuff. Even when you're blind, I told him. Sex for your environs, they're all clueless now. Where's your magic death potion? I asked him out loud and in my mind at the same time. Inside, down the stairs, through the tunnels, down the hallway to the right, and into a door labeled office, said Dirk. Thanks, I said, and ran into the building. I ran down the stairs <laughs> and into the dreaded torture chamber, where I took the liberty of punching the control table. It crumpled. I ran down a dimly lit hallway and into a room labeled office. I looked around me. The walls were painted burgundy. There was a wood desk in the center of the room with two books on it. I walked over to the books and opened them. Saving the environment for dummies, said one. Amazing scientific oh. experiments, said one. Put the books back on the desk and looked around for the potion. There was a little stand where there were about three potions. Well, about. We're not sure. Maybe, maybe four. It might be like two. I don't know. <laughs> I can't count. Grand. One was the blue potion that could send me back home. Then there were two more. One was a flat gray mixture and the other was glowing bright pink. I went back to the desk and picked up the science book. I browsed through it. When I couldn't find the gray potion in there, I went to the index. I looked up Eternal oh. Life and went to that page. What the heck kind of... <laughs> what the heck kind of book would just give away the secret of internal life? Then I realized something. Dirk had written this. There was a picture of the gray potion and a caption under it that said antidote. Oh. I corked the blue one and the gray one, but not before my curiosity had overtook me and I just had to look up the pink one. I thumbed through the book for the drawing of the pink potion. I found the only one and then read about it. Pink potion. Drink and good luck will guide you in all that you do. Oh my gosh. It's Felix Felicis. After some strenuous debating with myself, I decided to drink it. I gulped it down and all of a sudden, Evan burst in and cried, It's over. We won. <laughs> <laughs> That's some luck. After that, we ran back up to the field with potions in hand to observe what we'd done. Almost all the environs lay on the ground, either dead or injured, and the rest of them that weren't mortally wounded were standing in a vanquished-looking group by the Aubrey tree. We all cheered, and I uncorked the Wait, paper. why is it the Aubrey tree, though? Because originally Aubrey died underneath it, and that was the epicenter that sent all the other events into motion that, like, led the environs to take over the but world. But that didn't happen in this timeline, yes, right? Yes, it didn't happen. But I guess th it's so still the same, like, it's still the same tree. Oh, they chopped okay. It down. Uh, so she neglects to give Dirk Mortimer the potion that will kill him and make him... <laughs> um, but I guess it's inferred that it's going to happen. She drinks the blue potion and goes back to her regular time period. Um, she goes there. She's old again. Turns out they're living in the writer headquarters. She goes in. Evan's trying to cook. It explodes. They're fine. And then he's like, come with me. I follow him into the garage where he opens up a cupboard and pulls out a box. He then opens the box and takes out a beaker full of glowing blue liquid. Wait, I say, I think I know where this is going. Have you ever wanted to see what the past looks like? Evan says. How far in the past, I ask him. I don't know. However far you want to go, I guess, Evan says, shrugging. I look him squarely in the eyes. Are you sure, I ask him. You might never see me again. You'll come back, Evan says. You drink the pink potion, remember? So this is where I have to turn it over to you. 2007. I opened my eyes about two seconds before I saw the giant hunk of metal hurling towards me. What the? I yelled. It screeched trying to stop and then it hit me. So are we old Corinne or new Corinne? In this we point? are old Corinne. No, we are, we are, we are old lady not old time traveling Corinne now, but now she's into who gets hit by a truck. Yeah, she's in 2007. She's just fucking time traveled back to 2007 just because I wanted to, and now she's 12. Wow, I said, what happened? Why am I in the hospital? We accidentally hit you with our car, said the lady who told me what year it was. You're standing in the middle of the road. Are you from the future? asked the little girl. I laughed. What makes you think that? I asked her. Your clothes are different, the little girl told me, and you asked what year it was, and you got run over by a car, and you live. 
Huh, I said, well, you can't get more obvious than that. Okay, yeah, I'm from the future. Really, said the boy. Like, whoa. The ladies just stood there. Like, what's your name? Asked the boy. Does everyone say like in 2007? Yes, just the boy, though. It's Corinne, I told him. What's your name? It's Rowan, said the boy. This is my sister, Abby. Nice to meet you, I said. Well then, said the lady who had told me what year it was, would you like me to call your parents? These people just wouldn't grasp the concept that I was from the future. Um, I'm an orphan. I live on the streets. I lied so I wouldn't have to explain the whole potion thing. Oh, the lady cried. We'll just have to take you home with us then. I nodded. Won't you have to file legal papers or something? I asked her. Oh, of course, the lady confirmed, but you can stay at our house until we do. I shook her hand. Thanks, I said. She just freaking gets adopted by these people. Right? Aren't there legal things you have to do? No, because you don't exist in this timeline. That's like, that's like fucking when the Dizzos go to the orphanage that doesn't exist and the lady just helps them extort. <laughs> right? We can go shopping tomorrow and get you some new clothes. Would you like to go to school? Karen asked me. Karen's the mom. Sure, I said. I've never been to school. The sad but honest truth. Great, exclaimed Karen. I'll enroll you on Monday and you can start on Tuesday. Oh did you put a Karen in to show people that it's not pronounced Karen is pronounced Karen? Honestly, like this is Karen. I, think I actually did that. I don't like. I didn't remember until you said that, but that sounds like something I would have done. So then she meets me. Oh boy, twelve-year-old girl me just got there. Um, I start out by saying, "What kind of outfit is that?" And uh, so twelve-year-old girl me is named Marley. Wow, Marley said as we went over a speed bump. And you're blind. How do you manage? Well, I can still see things, but they're all blurry, I lied. Interesting, said Marley. That would make a good book. What, a blind girl who lives on the streets, I said? I'll bet somebody already wrote it. No, I mean, I'd spice it up a little. Maybe you'd have a secret boyfriend. Maybe you'd be in the distant future. Maybe you'd, you could have some kind of special powers, and you could have to save the world from something. What do you think, Marley asked. Sounds neat, I said. I mean, I would totally read it. Yeah, Marley said dreamily. You like to write books? I hate everything about this. Nah, I said. I've never been on a computer. Otherwise, I think I'd be pretty darn good at it. I think you would be too, Marley told me sincerely. I love to write. It's pretty much all I do when I'm not in school. Speaking of school, here we are. Rowan looked around. There are bullies after me, he said. Bullies, I asked, looking at Marley and Megan. They're on recess, by the way. I'll take care of them, I told Rowan. What? Marley practically shouted. You can't just go up to them. They rule the school, frightening away all manner of little kids and rampaging their realm from morning till night. Believe me, I said. I've taken down far bigger fiends than this. I followed Rowan around the corner of the building to find a group of nicely dressed girls. Rowan hid behind me. What's wrong, I asked. They're just a bunch of girls. And you're not a girl, asked one. Ouch. The girls' cronies all laughed like a bunch of cute robots. Listen, I started, but was cut off. No, you listen up, you twerp, said the leader girl. Don't you ever face up to me again, you hear? You know what that reminds me of, I said? Beverly Hillbillies. Y'all come back now, you hear? The leader girl looked hurt, but I knew it wasn't over. Of all the battles I'd ever fought, this had to be the easiest. Well, you, the girl started. I wasn't finished, I said. You better stop this maltreatment. I'm going to stop bullying you like you've apparently been bullying everyone because I'm not that kind of person. But seriously, I think we've all gotten kind of tired of your singling out people, so stop. And by the time I'm done, you will have forgotten all this because as I'm speaking, I'm changing you so you are a completely nice straight A's student. I want to fly into the sun. Marley's like, what? How'd you do that? You'll think I'm crazy, but okay. I'm not actually 12. I'm 60. I drank a potion in the very distant future and I time traveled here. I'm a superhuman called a writer who can change history of the future and I have saved the world multiple times. Marley and Megan and Rowan and the group of former bullies all stared at me in awe. I believe you completely, Marley said. You do? I asked. Oh, totally. First, because I'm an author. Secondly, because anything with that much detail has to be true, Marley answered. That's... That is the opposite of how it works. Super flawed. What was the potion made of that you drank to get here? And she's like, I racked my brain trying to remember something I'd read in Dirk Mortimer's book of potions. Zinc, neon, phosphorus, radon, and manganese, I answered with certain certainty. Megan looked at Marley. We have all those in the school science lab. <laughs> what? No. They're 12. Radon. Why are they allowed to play with radon? Naturally occurring radioactive gas that can cause lung cancer. You can't see or smell radon. Testing is the only way to know your level of exposure. <laughs> <laughs> we have that in the school no, science it gets lab. worse and worse. You're not ready for this. Can we use some of your chemicals or whatever, Megan asked? They're in the science lab now. Oh, of course, Mrs. Scopaland said and led us over to the table. What are you making today? It's the science version of greasy, grimy gopher guts that you eat, Marley lied. You can eat it, Mrs. Scopaland asked with interest. I'll have to teach that to the class. Oh, no, Megan said. There's not enough here to teach it to the class. You need bucketfuls and bucketfuls. Well, all right, Mrs. Gopalan said. What was it made out of, Marley asked again. Zinc, um, phosphorus, manganese, radon, and neon, I answered. Radon, Mrs. Gopalan exclaimed. You can't eat that. 
you can when you mix it with all these other chemicals or elements of whatever you call them. Vegan said it's like a chemical reaction. Mrs. Gopalan seemed to calm down a little. She's such an idiot. How did you get She's this degree? immediately just like, oh, that's fine then, as long as you mix it with these other chemicals. She's and radar won't and kill And she's you. the science teacher. So they put it in a beaker and shake it. I'll eat it, I volunteered, even though I was going to be the one to eat it anyway. I wanted to make sure that Mrs. Gopalan was completely unsuspecting. Wait, I said loudly. You don't happen to have any pink sprinkles, do you, Mrs. Scopalan? I asked. Oh, Mrs. Scopalan exclaimed, I actually do. I made a cake last night to take to a teacher's luncheon. I have sprinkles in my purse. Let me go get the Deus Ex sprinkles. Why sprinkles? Marley and Megan asked at the same time. You need something sweet to put in it because the one that I took to get here didn't have any sweetness. If you put it in something different, you get a different effect, I said. So she drinks it and goes back to the future. Oh my god, I even referenced the next book in this. I know everything, thankfully, about the current time period. I know who I'm going to vote for to be president, Christoph Merck, who I admire for his leadership abilities and his great way of making the public like him. Does he end up being Yeah, he ends up being the major villain of the next three books. <laughs> Fucking, I predicted the Trump presidency. Uh, nope. Corinne is a Republican. Holy shit. I, I don't know. Nope, I don't even want to think about that. I know that the Kings played the Lakers. Yes, they're still playing and won last night. I know that this is where I'm supposed to be in this time period with my family in my house. So she walks back to the house. She has grandchildren named Jack and Kiara. And Kiara's the protagonist of the next three books. Old Corinne is like, hey, Kiara, um, since I'm old as fuck now. You're going to save the world. And Kira's like, awesome. Kira, remember when I told you about writers? Yeah, they're superhuman people who can change the past and future. Okay, good, because that's what you are now. <laughs> that's just how she changes her into one. Bam. <laughs> that's what you are. Good, I'm glad you remember the writers. There's an epilogue. <laughs> There's an epilogue. I didn't want you to see it. <laughs> Howdy, peoples. What's up? This is your planet saver speaking. Beware, evil peoples. I have been entrusted with saving the world, and there isn't anything that you evil dudes can do about it. I might be back, I might not. It depends on how well you people take care of the Earth. It's the only one you've got. Like I said, I might be back, and I might not be back. If I do come back, then watch out, evildoers. It ain't gonna be very pretty. Sincerely, Kira. I want to vomit. I've been entrusted with saving the world, and there isn't anything you evil dudes can do about it. All I can think of is like, I'm the Avatar! You gotta deal with it! Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Retrospection Section. Join us next time for the beginning of the next trilogy in this series, in which Kiera is apparently the new Avatar. Special guests include Undead Corinne, a dark and brooding bounty hunter, Evan in disguise, Otto in disguise, two more randomly adopted children, another meteor plummeting towards Earth, and a president-slash-dictator whose name is, surprisingly, not Donald Trump. Corinne falls victim to the 2008 vampire craze in The Plan, The Purpose, and The Judgment next time on Retrospection Section.